Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon from wherever you are in the world and welcome to our virtual showcase. Thank you for taking the time to join myself and our sponsors spanning on today's discussion, which is focused on how it's not a matter of if, but when the risk of attack in today's cyber threat landscape. My name is Nick Pryke. I'll be your host for the next 90 minutes and very much looking to fill that role. My purpose is to get us going, keep the conversation balanced and give you all the open space to explore challenges, share insights and connect those all important experiences. To that extent, a couple of quick bits of housekeeping before we get started. This is a closed door session. Nothing we discuss here will be released into the public domain. So please do feel comfortable and share those all important perspectives. Today's showcase will contain a keynote and a panel discussion, both of which will have an open audience Q&A session after. So please do get involved. We actively encourage it. Uh, to do so, we'll have Adam, our technical operator, who's sat in the studio here with me on hand to field any questions and get you ready to ask away. Simply drop your question in the Q&A in the navigation bar at the bottom there, or DM myself, Adam, or any of our panelists, and we will bring you up when that time is right. In the same vein, please do feel free to connect with one another over the next 90 minutes. This showcase is all about getting the most out of your time here. And to make sure that continues past today, our team at Synergy will be following up with you after the showcase to get feedback on your experience, any connections that you would like to make, and we'll also provide you with today's recording and any further information from the discussion that you would like. But enough from me and more about what we're here for today. So in the last 12 months alone, 50% of organizations faced a ransomware attack with SaaS data taking pole position in the crosshairs of threat actors across the globe at a whopping 51%. An increasingly common target, intelligence shows that ransomware was indeed most successful at penetrating defences intended to encrypt SaaS data, outperforming attacks on cloud infrastructure, on-premise systems, and indeed endpoints. Drop below that surface, however, and it becomes clear that an increasing majority of these ransomware attacks leverage social engineering techniques such as phishing. The kicker here, well, with the emergence of AI, it's already advancing in its sophistication. From writing emails that bypass traditional spam filters to ranking malicious content with legitimate SEO techniques and even tricking biometric safeguards such as voice authentication, AI is expanding the threat actors toolkit. There is no doubt about that. For organizations, the risk of attack is becoming a case of not if, but when. But with the right insights and layered defense approach, organizations can protect and minimize from authentication, encryption, and antivirus to backups and a host of other security fundamentals to help reduce the frequency and severity of attacks. This showcase, and indeed our next 90 minutes, will explore how organizations with the right processes, systems, and recovery plans in place can reduce damage and resume business as quickly and securely as possible. So join us as we navigate through a landscape of ever tightening compliance, regulations, and cyber insurance, unlocking a better protected future from today's chaotic threat landscape. And to kick things off on that journey, I'd like to welcome our keynote speaker for today, a virtual round of applause, if you will, for Adam Margett, Product Marketing Manager at Backup and Recovery Platform Expert, spanning a Kaseya company. Hello, Adam. Good morning to you, sir. Are you there? Hello, Adam. Hello. Hello, Nick. How you Good doing? afternoon. I'm doing very well, thank you. And yourself? Oh, two seconds. I don't think you may be on mute. We'll just get you unmuted there. There Where we go. Am I? I'm in now. Awesome. Hey, you Nick, thanks indeed. so much for, for having me. How are you, sir? I'm very well, thank you. A pleasure. And with that, I will get out of your hair. A quick reminder to our audience, uh, I will be rejoining Adam in the, around about 50 minutes for our first of two audience Q&As. So please do feel free as you're going through and listening to Adam over the next 50 minutes or so to drop your questions in that Q&A. We'll bring you up on stage to talk with Adam post keynote. But for now, Adam, over to yourself, sir. 
Awesome. Nick, thank you so much and a, a welcome into our audience. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak with you. And I'm very much looking forward uh, to speaking with some of the other experts and practitioners in the field as a part of our panel discussion. But I think Nick did a fantastic job of really setting the stage with regards to a lot of the concerns and the challenges that IT professionals are out there facing when it comes to the reality of, of a turbulent and tumultuous cyber landscape that we're all forced to navigate. Before we dive in, my name is Adam Margett. I'm a product marketing manager here at, uh, at Kaseya for our unified backup products, spanning backup for SaaS applications and Unitrends for on-prem infrastructure. I've been in this role for about the last four years, going on a little over seven years with Kaseya. And one of the things I've really enjoyed about my time in the product marketing role is that we sit in the intersection between the engineering and the development teams that are building tools tools to help our users solve these challenges, do things more efficiently, more securely, and the customers that are consuming that technology and those end users. What are their concerns? What do they like? What are they worried about tomorrow, a week from now, six months from now, and more? So it's been a, a fascinating journey, and I'm excited to share some of my experience and some of my learnings from the field as we explore you know, the evolution of cyber threats, where we're at today, and how AI, unfortunately, has been a tool that is being weaponized against us by a lot of these threat actors. Our conversation really begins with the idea of hybrid work and hybrid workers. There was a huge transition a couple of years ago, and before COVID and the and the pandemic, anyone that was talking about hybrid was probably talking about the cloud and starting to move into SaaS applications or um, you know cloud hosted infrastructure. They weren't talking about working and our environments and our end users that are now outside of the firewall. At that time, we were just really starting to get a firm grasp on a lot of those advantages. We're bringing in the, the SaaS application models. We're recognizing the elasticity and the scalability of the cloud. And then all of that was accelerated very, very rapidly, including now our hybrid workers. So our technology stack is not the only thing that's changed and really increased in complexity, both from kind of a management and a holistic perspective. It's our workforce now as well. They're tougher to manage. They're on their own networks. They're using less secure Wi-Fi at home, in hotels, in coffee shops. They're outside of the firewall. So things like patching, monitoring, troubleshooting, even taking backups for these users has become more difficult. And for IT pros, a lot of the ones that we work with, they're managing many different platforms, on-premises, SaaS applications, infrastructure as a service, and they've all got their own unique challenges around backup, security, recovery, and, and things like that. It's a situation that we expect to say. Uh, studies uh, published by Upwork, by 2025, it's estimated that more than 33 million Americans, where I'm based here in the United States, will be working remotely. And that's a, a pretty significant uptick that really lends itself towards a continuous shift in these remote working arrangements. Now, for these end users, they are ultimately the primary target for a majority of these cyber attacks. And this started off during COVID with the Zoom bombers. You saw maybe some of the, the more, I, I hesitate to use the word comical, but some of the, the funnier instances where someone would bomb a class lecture and maybe put something up on the screen that was inappropriate or profane. Maybe they're spamming memes or, or joke gifs or things like that. But the use case very rapidly became more nefarious, where once an account was compromised, threat actors would use that guise of a Zoom meeting, a Teams meeting, to drop malicious links into the calendar as reminders for um, appointments or meetings that were just coming up. Now, this is old hat. We're familiar with phishing. It's a technique and a tactic that's been around for a long time. But where we're starting to see them improve is in the sophistication and the overall look and feel of a lot of these attacks. And AI is one of the tools that's helping threat actors do so, overcoming some of those challenges of, say, English as a second language, for example, where sometimes you would notice some odd spelling or grammatical errors. AI is able to clean those up and develop very credible emails. They're starting to brand these emails and they personalize them. So an example that we came across recently, they were using the Zoom logo embedded within the email to build trust. 
the subject line uh, had the user's name included in there for a more personalized touch. It's been redacted from the from screenshots in the article that we had found. But in a lot of cases, they're trying to elicit an emotional response from our users. There's a late payment. You're missing a meeting. Your account has been suspended. Your shipping has been rerouted. Did you authorize this bank withdrawal? They want to take advantage of users that are confused, they're moving quickly, and they want to go through and click. Now, in this particular attack, it was in two phases to gain access to these credentials. They identified their target, they dropped in the Zoom link, and then they were prompted to reset or to enter in their password. So the main call to action within that email took users to a fake login page that looks pretty good with regards to you know imitating a legitimate Microsoft page. The Microsoft logo and the familiar uh, login feel with the sign up options was large and dominated in the page. They've got copyrights down in the bottom. Now, a more experienced eye would recognize the link up top here as looking completely illegitimate, but you know, we've seen a lot of these landing pages are similar that are spoofed and used with these targeted attacks. The page dominated by the login prompt, the victim's email address has already been populated and scripted in there. And this helps the attackers really foster a sense of trust in their victims, making it more easy to extract those credentials and gain access to that account. And for our users, the concern there isn't just that they've gotten now access to an email account, though that certainly is a concern. Now they have that network access. But Google reported that 65% of users reuse the same password for all uh, of their websites and logins. So what gave them access to email is also now giving them access to um, their users OneDrive with uh, potentially uh, credit. Uh, personal or valuable files, OneDrive, ERP systems, your CRM, other systems within your organization. So there's a significant threat that once they gain that access, it's not just the inbox that they are able to access. They're able to very quickly proliferate and spread and gain access to other sensitive repositories and other sensitive data throughout the organization. Phishing is not the only attack that we uh, need to worry about. In a lot of ways, it's it's a replaying of the greatest hits and everything out there that's old is, is new again. Social engineering is on the rise. It's the most common way for the bad guys to steal credentials and to further an attack where that's how access is granted in the first place. Phishing attacks are, are typically performed at scale. They're looking to catch someone that's unsuspecting or vulnerable at a specific point in time. The holidays coming up, for example, in a couple of months here in the United States around shipping, gifting, charitable donations is usually when we see a, a pretty significant uptick in some of those phishing attacks. But there are more targeted attacks as well, spear phishing, where they understand the role. What is that user doing? AI is going to or has the potential to help further these attacks to make them more scalable and more believable to target out specific victims. Quid pro quo, this happened at Tesla. Russian hackers bribed an employee $500,000 to install ransomware that was, infect, uh, that was located on an infected USB drive. When the employee started to get cold feet, they upped the bribe to a million. Now, the, the Russian hackers were caught, they were fined, they spent 10 months in custody, and then they were deported. But they were a USB being plugged into a network-attached device from potentially bringing down or being able to extort uh, Tesla. Vishing is the other one I wanted to call out here, and this is one where AI has really scary implications. When you're able to add calls or voicemails into these attacks in coordination with the more traditional phishing emails, researchers at PurpleSec found that this more than doubled the success rate of the attack, getting users to take the action, submit the credentials, or click the link, up from 37% to more than 75% of attacks. Now, we've got an example that we'll share with you where AI is being used and is very credible even in its early stages in imitating voice and the potential for it to proliferate these sorts of attacks are, uh, it simply is, it's terrifying. It's really staggering. Now, we mentioned that they're looking for access and Nick in his keynote mentioned that SaaS applications are, um, are particularly or were particularly vulnerable to ransomware. And the research bears that out. Uh, findings published on Continuity Central revealed that really all environments have undergone an increased rate of attack, to about 60% of increase on attacks against SaaS applications 
endpoints and public cloud infrastructure, potentially you know, outside of the corporate firewall for endpoints, uh, you know, really vulnerable devices. And again, they're going after those employees on the edge. Now, they were the most successful in encrypting SaaS data, the least successful against public cloud infrastructure. But the findings from the respondents in this survey found that, hey, you know what? We, we really should be implementing third-party measures to help protect our cloud environments and our SaaS applications. There's the idea of that shared responsibility model. We're going to explore kind of the implications of that. But for a lot of these organizations that were hit with ransomware, they're recognizing data protection from security to even backup and recovery is that critical last line of defense. Now, you know, it's your environment, it's your data. Would you risk it? I was just down at Spiceworks, Spice World 2023 last week, and I was chatting with an IT director that was down at the show after one of the presentations. And we we're kind of talking about you know, how his infrastructure has changed and where their organization was going. And we were asking a little bit about data protection. And he said, Adam, I don't view this as, you know, I've got to protect my cloud infrastructure, my on-prem infrastructure, backup infrastructure. He says, I don't look at it in silos like that. When I'm talking and thinking about my data, it's all my data, and I have to protect it regardless of where it's running and where it's living. And so the risk that the findings at Continuity Central revealed that was that outside of the on-premise data center, full recovery from a ransomware attack was essentially the flip of a coin. And what's scary about ransomware is that for attackers that disclosed the breach, the data breach, in 27% of cases, as reported by IBM's cost of a data breach report, the, <clears throat> the outcome or the cost of remediating that breach was 20% higher than those where either internal tools or a benevolent third party disclosed the result of a breach. But by the time that they have hit you with that login screen, Data has been extorted. The, in, the damage and the proliferation throughout the environment is intense. And when the attackers are at the point where they can disclose the breach, we are within your environment. You need to pay us for your data to get back. IBM found that that was a very difficult situation and a very costly situation for organizations to get out of. There is also the matter of in engaging with law enforcement for organizations that did not, they suffered about a 10% higher cost and about a month added to their breach remediation life cycle. So I know that, you know, to pay or to not pay a ransom is a difficult and ethical question. And the, the feelings or your sentiments may depend on the situation of your organization and of what's going on at that point in time. I do know that experts at the FBI and throughout the cybersecurity community typically recommend against paying a ransom. It furthers uh, future criminal activity. It emboldens attackers. But I realize that that's not always the most realistic scenario. And ultimately, recovery and that last line of defense is critical. Now, AI is lending and there's some, we've talked a little bit about AI and its role. And I don't think that we're on the brink of a, a Terminator scenario or Will Smith in iRobot, but there are some serious dangers. For a little bit of fun, I played around with an image generator, and it's not perfect. I asked it to generate some salmon swimming in a river. And, you know, with a little bit of coaxing, uh, I got these delightful looking uh, fillets that were kind of floating around in the water there. But the image on your top left has also been generated by AI. And what's scary is that if prompted correctly and validated by a user, AI can already create some pretty convincing content or imagery. We see this being used a lot online and in social media, on the social networks, whether it be things like Twitter or X, LinkedIn, where when you start to crop and shrink down those faces, you can eliminate some of the funny, wonky artifacts that will appear on the borders or the periphery around a lot of those AI-generated Subject. So it's it's being used as a tool. I think Nick mentioned in his email that AI can be used now to bypass spam filters. I came across an article where the prompt to the chatbot was to build me phishing training awareness emails that can get through a spam filter. So under the guise of education and awareness, the chatbot developed emails and content that was successfully able to pass through the spam filter. The catch was it wasn't being used for training. They were used nefariously. We're also seeing bots being used to bring malicious content and links higher up in legitimate SEO terms using 
uh, real you know, keyword analysis, headers and title tags, all sort of things that, that companies are doing to get their results higher up on search engines, AI can do that for us as well. So they're taking advantage of unsuspecting users that are looking for a solution or a particular service, ranking in that malicious content. So someone finding or looking for legitimate information is stumbling across links that could potentially lead to infection or a compromise of their credentials and so forth. Now, you might be thinking, I'm smarter than that. I can trust my eyes. I know what to look for. But it is, you know, it's tricky and it's scary out there. This happened earlier this year where a Bloomberg feed account that is not associated with Bloomberg, but with the ability to buy that blue check mark for $8 um, was out there and looking like a very legitimate account aimed um, you know, aimed to really spark a disinformation campaign. In this example, you know, a lot of people wouldn't take a social media seriously if they saw, you know, one post, but there was such a volume of retweets and follows around what was going on in different accounts and different communities. There was legitimate fear that the Pentagon was under attack. This was entirely AI generated. The account was a fake. It was later disbanded, but it was time just after the stock market opened and for gold, bonds, and other assets that people typically buy during doomsday uh, scenarios or doomsday times, all of those assets started to fight. This was entirely AI generated from the accounts, the images, and the text out, and they were able to build a giant misinformation network that ultimately went viral. So now I can trust my eyes. I want to verify these sources. I might see this on Bloomberg and go to another website. But what about your eyes and your ears? And this is where the idea of biometrics and voice comes into play. And this one I found was, was fascinating and really terrifying. A journalist at the Wall Street Journal attempted to clone herself with AI, and she put it through a number of tests to see how credible and how legitimate was it. She was able to conduct an interview with the CEO of Snap using her AI-generated self completely successfully without the CEO uh, knowing or being on to the ruse. It wasn't able to generate content for TikTok despite having her lightness and having some prompts via chat GPT. But the AI was able to clone her voice and successfully pass those banking biometrics. So what's really scary here is we talked about earlier the impact of vishing and the credibility that it can lend to a campaign. If this was an unsuspecting user of yours, a lower ranking employee, maybe in the finance or the accounting office, and they get a call from someone that sounds just like the CEO that they hear every quarter on the company all hands call saying that I'm about to get on a plane, but I need you to authorize a payment for this vendor or for this product. I'm going to send it through. I'm calling to give you the heads up. You're going to see the PDF hit your inbox or the DocuSign hit your inbox in a couple of minutes. They've landed that call, the user's expecting it, and now a very credible and legitimate looking email comes through into that user's inbox. It's a very scary proposition. Now, it wasn't quite ready to be able to sit in for a full meeting with other work and colleagues, but even just through some of these examples, it's 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 fun, it's exciting, but the, the implications with this falling into the wrong hands are, are frankly pretty terrifying. Now, once they've got that access and all the different ways to get in, what is it that they are after? IBM reported that 71% of data breaches are financially motivated. They're looking to be able to hit you with that ransom demand. They're extorting critical data. They might be stealing credentials. In a lot of cases, they're after customer and employee PII. This was the costliest record type that was compromised and the largest in terms of volume or percentage of data that was compromised as well. And this is where, you know, the majority of these, or the minority, a large minority of these breaches were identified by internal tools. So they are very effective at obfuscating their activity within the network, subverting traditional defenses and kind of hiding in wait until they are ready to try to extract that ransom or hit you with that extortion demand. There's a very, uh, only about a third of breaches that are recognized by internal tools. And we talked earlier about the cost of those attacker disclosed uh, incidents, which is pretty staggering. 
So what can they do once they're inside? There are all sorts of attacks. In, in code spaces, it was a complete destruction attack. An employee that was being terminated had access to unencrypted Amazon containers and their backups. They blew all of that away, the production containers, the backups as well, and code spaces went defunct very shortly after. Rockstar source code was leaked online in a malicious attack and for Uber and um, Grubb and Shire, Milis and Sachs, a law firm in New York, resources or data that was exfiltrated was held hostage for ransom, but they're not always after money. In the case of Medibank, they were exfiltrating data around sensitive health records and health procedures that people had had uh, that went against these attackers and their groups kind of ideologies. And they used that data for targeted harassment campaigns and to further sow discord and enmity throughout the state. So a lot of these attacks are destructive. They are going after your data. They will attempt to demand that ransom or that extortion. And in some cases, we've seen attackers lean into our heightened sensitivity for ransomware to get away with some of these destructive attacks. The Azure Wiper attacks from earlier in this summer were destructive attacks that were disguised as ransomware. The attackers used unpatched internet-facing devices, vulnerable Azure Active Directory configurations to install malicious admin accounts, install legitimate tools to hide their, uh, hide their actions and obfuscate what they were doing within the environment. But ultimately, as the victims thought that there's encryption and malicious activity going on, we'll wait this out. We need to work through a decryption, you know, find a way to get a decryption key. What options do we have as they're working through and attempting to respond to ransomware? When they went back in to investigate the environment, all of the, the cloud environment, the virtual machines, the storage, the networking, et cetera, was entirely destroyed. And in some of these cases, they do not need to even compromise an endpoint. In another attack that was similar, using APIs and administrative accounts that were not protected by MFA, they were able to compromise global SaaS admin accounts. They created malicious Omega users with global admin capabilities, and they started to very quickly remove legitimate admins to prevent a response. They exfiltrated data. They demanded uh, extortion payments to not leak the data that was extracted and exfiltrated. And they executed DDoS attacks against Microsoft to take down other services and cause more widespread panic. So we see a number of these different attacks. Most commonly, they're going after those users, but they don't necessarily have to. Our environments and the attack surface is so broad today I'm really, you know, eager to talk to some of the folks on our panel to see how they're facing this challenge. It's a it's a significant one. But from my standpoint, what are the steps that we can take to defend our users, our data, and our organization? You know, I came across some interesting findings from Google that was all about the cyber hygiene habits of different generations in the workforce. And we're coming on a significant turning point where a lot of the, the generation below me, I was born in 1990, so I'm a millennial, but the generation right after me and even after them is starting to come into the workforce. And they're pretty familiar with things like MFA. They've been using it on their social media accounts. They regularly update their applications, but they're less likely to change their passwords and to have that good password hygiene. They may not be super aware in terms of phishing and what the implications are. But on the other side, some of our aging workforce, they've been trained and drilled. They understand the importance of updating their software. They're more likely to rotate and use different passwords but password management becomes a problem. They're less likely to use password managers. So if you're anything like you know, some of my older relatives, um, they might be written down in a file cabinet. Are they on a sticky note under the mouse pad or something? You know, Even thinking about the physical space of our offices and what data is out there. For a lot of us, we're back in the office and that physical security matters again. So understanding the users is really important. And even just anecdotally, I work with a lot of folks that are that are younger. Um, my fiance works and manages a team of folks that are about 23, 24. They're just coming into the workforce. And this is a generation that's grown up on their phones and they're very used to that instant gratification. And I think that that overall mindset and that very rapid response, I want to get to this right away, 
It's really scary when you think about phishing and what they're trying to elicit these victims to do, to take that action quickly and without thought. They react very emotionally. So even in some cases, the education around these users and who's coming into the workforce is really important. Ultimately, it comes down to a layered defense. Just because you implement multi-factor authentication or you buy the greatest firewall that Palo Alto or others you know, have to offer in the market, it's not going to stop all of these attacks. Attacks can come from multiple sources. They can originate in between those layers. We've seen that they were able to compromise vulnerable AD configurations. They didn't need a phishing user to get through, or they didn't need a phishing attack to get through the spam filter to get by the employee and their thought process to take that click. So things can originate between different layers. And for losses that are not caught or prevented, you know, we need to look into that. And where can we improve that protection? For a lot of folks that I was talking to down in Texas last week, they're really interested in exploring endpoint detection and response technologies. They want to understand when there is atypical and anomalous activity happening on the endpoint that sits outside of the firewall so that they can take more immediate action to suspect or unusual behavior on that machine. So it's important to think about our strategy, the different layers and different ways that attacks can come in. But eventually, you know, there's no silver bullet in this world. If there was, there wouldn't be you know, all these vendors in the space trying to continue to innovate and catch up and, and stay in front of these attackers. Data loss does happen. If that data lives in the cloud, and that's what we at Spanning Backup really focus in on is protecting data in your SaaS applications, Microsoft 365, Google, Workspace, and Salesforce. Depending on your vendor and their SLAs and what sort of incident happens, these data loss events are not the responsibility of Microsoft or of Google. So yes, they might be able to roll back that SharePoint site to a state that it was in last week. There may be that deleted, you know, that secondary mailbox for 93 days on your OneDrive or your SharePoint where you can restore data, but things like unauthorized action or lack of action from employees, failure to follow appropriate security protect practices, even faulty input or instructions. Um, you know, looking at things like a scripting error that one runs wild and crashes the SharePoint site, there's not going to be granular controls within Microsoft to be able to restore and respond that data. But ultimately, you want to ensure that regardless of where that data lives, you have the right strategies and the right protection in place. IBM found that on average, organizations that had high levels of incident response planning as well as testing, the tabletop drills, ensuring that everyone knows when to break glass, what is that call tree, uh, the infrastructure aspects of that, recovering and restoring applications and services lessened the overall cost of a data breach by almost 1.5 million or a million and a half dollars. The average cost of a breach in North America was about 4.35 million. So they were able to bring down that cost significantly, reduce the cost of that breach by almost 33% by having more rapid and ready response. Some other factors that they looked at and found had significant impact on reducing the overall cost of a breach were organizations that had a mature dev and security operations approach. They were regularly training their employees on cybersecurity awareness, the incident response planning and testing, and they were leveraging AI and machine learning driven insights, whether that be through something like analytics that can be provided via an EDR solution, ransomware detection from your backup appliance where it's looking at the history and the overall heuristics of the data that's in, that it's ingesting. You know, those different tools that help identify malicious activity earlier have helped speed up that response and organizations that have drilled and have that thorough response will be able to respond more quickly. Now, on the other hand, things that were increasing the cost of the organization was remote workforces were a factor. And we've talked all about the risks of end users and that kind of poses. We're struggling a lot with security sh skills shortages. If you're in the audience, you know, let us know in the chat, drop a, drop a two in the chat. If you've had trouble hiring and filling for roles, we know it's a really tough climate out there for a lot of organizations. And see, here they come you know, rolling in a couple of twos out there. We understand that. It's challenges that we face here uh, as well. 
Uh, Non-compliance with regulations and the fines and penalties that come with that certainly increase to the cost as well, but also attacks against the Internet of Things or operational technologies that IoT or those OT environments, such as in manufacturing or agriculture, had a pretty significant impact as well. Now, for one of our customers, they were using Google and they were relying on the sync and share feature before they came over to spanning backup. They were thinking, you know, sync and share is good. When something changes here, gets uploaded to the drive, we're all set. That worked until a user in their administrative office was phished. They clicked on the link and their file started being encrypted with malware. The sync and share tool doing its job recognized the change on these files and started to update them and push them up into the Google Drive. So ultimately, by the time IT realized what was going on, the user had recognized that something was wrong. It was thousands of files that had been encrypted and needed to be manually rolled back. And that was kind of the wake up group for our customer that said, you know, we won. We're not afraid of Google not doing their job, but employees are that kind of that risk. And that's what's kind of scary out there. And they recognize the idea that sometimes that asynchronous technology, while it is very convenient, it's very handy in a lot of use cases, that 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 point in time copy that's isolated from production, that good tested backup that they can rely on, they recognized was, was a piece that was missing within their strategy. And so they came on board to spanning. Ultimately, at Spanning and Kaseya, we have a litany of technologies within our portfolio to help build out that layered defense. From phishing defense tools on the front end that are almost like a, a gamification for your end users. We consume this tool internally and I can get spammers that are trying to solicit me for list buys and other things. I can get them out of my inbox forever. We play around and use that tool internally and it's one that is you know, really fun for me. I enjoy using it. Monitoring for credentials out on the dark web, the ability to um, uh, secure things with multi-factor authentication, remote into endpoints, immediately in troubleshoot, password management, documentation and collaboration, and ultimately backup and recovery as that last line of defense. It is absolutely critical to have that resilience in your strategy from a good tested backup is offsite and that you have confidence in that you can recover. So I think from here, we're going to move things into uh, the Q&A and the panel discussion, but I hope that you enjoyed the keynote. I saw some chats, um, some questions in the chat. So Nick, I don't know if the, the audience will get a recording or access to the presentation, but that's certainly you know a follow-up as far as the content that, that I can take uh, as well. They absolutely will do, Adam. First of all, thank you very much. Uh, a lot to unpack there. I'm not quite sure I can ever unsee Sam and Phyllis emulating uh, their <laughs> real life counterparts. It's uh, macabre to say the least, but makes a very clear point. And indeed, yeah, we have had a couple of uh, people ask in the chat, will we be receiving the slides from today? Absolutely. We'll make sure that everybody that joined today receives both the recording from the showcase and indeed Adam's fantastic slides there. We do have a question, Adam, from uh, Mohammed, which we'll come on to in a second. I just had a quick one, actually, just to kind of wrap us up. Well, two, actually, but I will let Mohammed ask his before I come back for my second. You mentioned there about, you know, th th this idea of, you know, I'm smarter than that. That won't happen to me, dot, 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 until it does. So obviously, you know, there's a lot of training that needs to be done with the human component there. Um, how, how, you know, in your perspective, in your opinion, how can leaders, businesses start better training their colleagues, their employees to get past that that point of uh, proverbial attitude there and kind of see the width of the trees? Is it about scare tactics? Does that play its part in kind of sewing, you know, similarly to how you have just done in your keynote? This is what's going on day to day. This is what can happen because this is what does happen. How, how do you how do you play that out? What advice can you offer there? You know, it's it's an interesting question, Nick, and it's one that I think, you know, I'd love to bring up with the with the panel as well to see what folks are doing in real time, because to me, I think that you need to strike a little bit of a balance. It is something that needs to be taken extremely seriously. There are significant implications potentially to our organization and to you as well personally, if that sort of information is used or falls into the wrong hands. But at the same time, it's important, I think, to not over-rotate on that sort of um, 
uh, you know, an overly severe or an overly punitive sort of culture. Employees that are scared of being reprimanded or scared of the uh, ramifications of having made a mistake are less likely potentially to come forward and report it. And we know that, that time is of the essence when it comes to being able to respond to these incidents. So we want to ensure that, yes, employees are educated. There are programs out there that regularly update their content. So if there's a particular trend that's going around, whether it be the Zoom bombers, for example, we want to train so that we've got practical understanding of what's happening. Again, the holiday season, um, you know, keep an eye out, verify when you get things from FedEx, UPS, Amazon, et cetera, really double check those links, never enter your credentials. If there's any question, log into the provider's website explicitly and verify your order status or your account there. You never go through an SMS link that was sent to you. But we also want to make sure that if someone does make that mistake, they feel empowered and safe to come forward very quickly. We want to know about that. And I think celebrating the wins is is, is important as well. Um, I take you know a, a pretty active stance at Kaseya. We're a huge company. We've got thousands of employees that are worldwide, but I like to think that I try to do my part. So when I get something odd, or maybe there's something that slipped through Graphis, it's a newer variant or it's a newer attack, it doesn't just look quite right. I forward it along to our SecOps team and I say, hey, you know, just a heads up, you may be aware of this, but I wanted you to know. And usually I get, you know, a nice email back, Adam, this was phishing. And, you know, even taking that a step further and celebrating those employees on like a monthly newsletter or something could be something to, you know, make sure that they feel that it's a safe space to come forward because ultimately we need them to be diligent, but it's impossible. We're all human. We make mistakes. So it is important that they, you know, understand the right steps and that, you know, they feel safe to come forward if they do feel that they've made an error or a mistake there. Mm -hmm. Love that, Adam. Yeah. Positive promotion, proactivity around that piece as well is important as, uh, yeah, as highlighting the the obvious dangers and, and the hugely significant risks associated with it. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to bring up uh, Mohammed, um, if you give us a couple of seconds. And Mohammed has a question for you on a, on a couple of your slides there, Adam. So if you give us just a few seconds, we will bring Mohammed. Good morning. Good afternoon, sir. I will hand you over to Adam to ask your question. Yeah, Adam, thank you for that. Um, uh, Nick, thank you, Adam. A wonderful presentation. First, I'd like to say, you know, you covered a lot uh, with all the statistics and all that. Uh, what uh, brings to my mind is that, uh, you know, you have explained what technically we could do and what income company can do and organization can do for employees uh, with the tools and, you know, training them and all that and making them aware. Uh, but what are the regulations doing in this front? Like the AI is it's it's Im being embedded in everything, our daily lives, you know, even the even from the coffee mark, uh, coffee that we pick up to the cars we drive. Uh, everything is, you know, somehow it's being AI manipulated or, you know, monitored or something of that sort. So what sort of defense is the regulation actually providing us? Are the are the governments or any bodies actually thinking towards this? Or, I mean, it's it's going to take some time for them to actually catch up. Uh, so, because this is, again, you know, with, with the information out there uh, and these threat actors actually using the AI to their advantage, when are the, you know, when are these, when are the other, you know, uh, governments, agencies, you know, uh, federal, you know, organizations, when are they going to understand all this? Thank you. You know, it, it's it's an interesting question. And it's one that is, you know, I'd be interested to to bring this up on the on the panel as well. As as far as I know, and in my experience, a lot of the the use of AI has really been up to the individual organizations. And we've certainly seen some companies that have embraced AI and have started to adopt it internally and others that say, I want nothing to do with these models or any sort of my data or IP being injected into them. But what's interesting is that a lot of these advancements are being driven commercially. Microsoft and others that are investing very heavily into these areas. And I think that it is important that regulators or there is a degree of regulation that comes up with regards to using these models and how they're going to be kind of governed or managed moving forward. I don't know that it's caught up to things like the, the NIST framework in terms of their recommendations when you get a little bit deeper into their strategy in terms of how to use or how to safely use AI. But I think that it's probably a big point of contention out there because we do want to ensure that there is proper regulation, 
but I think that a lot of what we've seen has been um, commercial use. You know, Google, for example, with Bard, um, you know, they're growing and using it very quickly. Microsoft invested in OpenAI. Canva is in uh, is integrating Chat GPT into their tools, even for for clients. But others like Samsung say we have no intention to bring this into our tools or to let our employees start to use this technology. So I think that. You know, an important piece of it as well, beyond just regulation, the number of companies that are using AI has started to grow very, very rapidly. And I think that regardless of the size of the organization or the use case, these efforts need to be tracked. I think in a lot of cases, they should be disclosed or information that should be disclosed publicly. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Fantastic. Mohammed, thank you very much for the question. We are going to wave goodbye to you, sir. We're going to keep you up on screen, Adam. Uh, and we're actually going to move us now into our panel discussion. Uh, indeed, before we do, uh, and just like Mohammed there, uh, we have another audience Q&A coming up after our panel. So if you want to ask any of our panel, all or specifically one, please do so. We'll bring you up on stage just as we've done with Mohammed there. Um, but... Without further ado, on to our panel, uh, which today is all about locking an open door, protecting against future threats. So over the next 20 minutes or so, we'll take a deeper dive into the perspectives of three IT security leaders exploring their expertise and getting real on the risks of tomorrow's threats today. And what a panel we have joining us. We have Richard Mendoza, Senior Director, Data Privacy and Regulatory Compliance at Reimagineers of Real Estate Anywhere Real Estate. We have Mel Reyes, uh, Global Chief Information Officer and CISO at the world's leading car sharing platform, Get Around. And we have Rick Baum, SVP of Information Security at Software Commerce Platform Perfectionist, EverCommerce. Chaps, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we'll give you all a couple of seconds to join us up on screen, uh, uh, on screen, I should say. And while we're doing that, to reintroduce, you already know him as Adam Margett, product marketing manager at Spanning, because that's exactly who he still is after his keynote. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Adam and our panel today. Gentlemen, can you all hear me loud and clear, first of all? Some nodding heads there. Richard, you can hear me as well. So, and a high five from Richard. Fantastic. Thank you very much for joining us today. And, you know, As I said, this really is a deeper dive into the hive mind of your experience, insights, and indeed your take on how IT and security professionals all on the call and showcase that they can better protect their colleagues' information and indeed the wider organization. So let, let's get straight into it. And Rick, I'm going to come down to you purely because you were down the bottom left of my screen as I looked up, not picking on you at all there. Um, but as you sit here today, what what are you know what are the biggest challenge or what are some of the biggest challenges you're facing when it comes to securing against those cyber threats, indeed in this AI accelerated world? What is coming off the horizon for you today, Rick? You know, what, um, you know, some of the examples that we saw Adam presenting earlier uh, are actually real life. We're seeing those coming in on a daily basis. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have a, a red team internally on my side and that I work very closely with. And we've been working with uh, some of the more nefarious AI uh, distributors like uh, Worm GPT and some of the others, as well as jailbroken versions of some of the uh, more popular mainstream uh, AI platforms. And thankfully, we had done a lot of testing uh, to 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 do things like creating. We saw the we saw the salmon, uh, which I I too will never unsee. Uh, but we uh, we did, we did some similar things like incorporating LinkedIn profiles uh, into sessions, other people's LinkedIn profiles, other people's CVs, and other people's prior emails, and then basically telling the the Worm GPT or or other chatbots create me an email, an eight threaded email between these two people using their personas that I've uploaded. And then inside of that, we embed our phishing documents and things. And, and then we make this eight threaded email with uh, with documents embedded into it. And then we forward it to the third person who is really our target. And they see, and it's, it's basically just like we saw with Adam, there's a lot of pretexting involved now. They see a very valid looking conversation between two very valid people that they would normally be speaking with. And then curiosity gets the best of them. They see a couple of documents in there. They log in immediately. You know, our man in the middle, MFA grabber, grabs their MFA, 
uh, we're using AI as well, use immediately log into that account and we own it. So we're showing that within our own community at Evercommerce, showing that as a live demo. But now, unfortunately, we're seeing the real versions of those. Uh, thankfully, they're not quite as well scripted as ours. They're, the URLs are you know, still a little bit you know, poorly, poorly constructed, but the email, the quality of the emails, just like we saw in Adam's presentation, the grammar is great. The, 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 all of the the things that we would normally see uh, that that throw up flags, you know, the poor grammar, the urgency, the the uh, the un expected and timeliness of these emails um, are really toned down because AI has really softened the blow of all of those and made them way more legitimate. We're seeing those. Unfortunately, now we're using AI to try to help find those same types of emails, of those out of place emails that, that really tick all the boxes. So we're seeing those things coming in real life. We're seeing them active. And what unfortunately, we're trying to raise our level of user awareness across our, our own entire entity uh, so that they know that if it still looks fishy, ask some questions about it because uh, they're getting better. And But like I said, they're, they're real life and they're, they're coming in today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, getting fishier and fishier by the day. Indeed. And I think, you know, to, to not get too deep into it, and Mel, I'm going to come up to you because I saw you nodding away there as, as, uh, as Rick was speaking, but, you know, increasingly as well, you know, white labeling, um, AI products, certainly chat GPT equivalents and many others, you know, that only continues to proliferate and deepen the, uh, the potential of new approaches into those ransomware attacks seemingly as buying an off-the-shelf product nowadays right so there's a lot that we need to watch out for there rick lovely stuff thank you very much mel i'm going to come up to you for the same question for, from the get around perspective what's coming off that horizon at breakneck speed for you today uh, uh so let me let me just recap one thing adam that was absolutely one of the best overviews that i've heard to date on the current impact of ai i have one piece that i'm gonna i'm gonna uh, disagree with uh skynet is coming it, it really is okay that's one two rick i think you're a bot because that summary was perfect those examples were perfect uh so i think you're 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 a video bot right now uh i'll be honest with you um the advancements that are being made in having ai actually uh, uh help bypass captcha and logic and all kinds of pieces that are really being built into there is the reason why I say Skynet is coming, right? Uh, the level of intelligence and awareness and training that we have to provide now has to escalate exponentially. We have to have people do the things that they would never do. I, I look at rough edges. I look at any anomalies. I'm a little bit OCD about that. I'm probably the 0.001%, right? When it comes to that, right? Or if you're in cybersecurity or otherwise. So- um, what my goal is uh, at Get Around and, and folks that I talk to is to really, really educate them, really question everything. I literally just got a text from my mother-in-law yesterday saying, you know, what do you think about these two sites? And they're looking at marketing. And I literally, I hopped on, obviously I have multiple layers of defense in place and I've got, and I hopped in and I was just like, I was like, it's a scam, ignore it, don't touch it, don't register, don't do anything, right? Um, but that was the traditional marketing type of piece. Now imagine you tie that into an elaborate set of chat bots, video bots, or anything else, and all of a sudden you're 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 entering in uh, bank account information, social security numbers, or anything else. Um, the importance, I, Rick, I like between just, just end the call now because Adam and Rick just covered most of what, you know, I, I was going to talk about anyway, but those table topics really educating the senior leadership on the actual viable threats that are out there is absolutely paramount. The backup and restoration, right? The abilities to have layers Right. You can you can be on the best platform on the planet and you can have at least one or two backups or redundancies. Guess what? The 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 vendor management piece, the men in the middle piece, all of these, you have to have as many layers in there. Um, I, I was on a discussion yesterday, and the one thing that is the most prevalent is we don't have enough people in security to be able to manage the education, the monitoring, and the layers of stacks. And when when you look at the the ROI or KPIs and everything else against security, you can you can gauge it on the risk, 
But how do you how do you gauge a, a zero incident ROI or KPI until it happens, right? And that's why almost you know everyone in the industry is reactive. But when it comes to AI, we are at a point in our history that is absolutely paramount to being able to make the investments in the tools, the people, and the education, bar none, to any advancement in technology, or we're screwed. Mel, thank you very much. And on that note, we're going to come down to Richard to get us for a full house for the panel. Richard, uh, hello, sir. For, from an anywhere real estate perspective, you know, Skynet from Mel, um, again, for, from Rick, similar things as well. Feel free to open up on anything you've heard there. You know, we've got Matt in the audience saying when you can ask ChatGPT to act like it's very scary and everybody agreeing there for obvious reason. But Back to to yourself, Richard, from the anywhere real estate perspective. Same question to you. You know, what is coming off that horizon? Agree with Rick, Mel, Adam. Anything you want to add in there? Yeah, I mean, as always, speaking for myself, not uh, obviously for the organization, but I think what we've seen is that it is teaching us that we need to think differently. We can't continue down the the standard path on how we eradicate our incident response to where. We need outside channels. We've seen, uh, you know, malicious actors slide into our conversations and slide into Teams messages and channels. So when you're dealing with an issue, you have to be out of band and out, out uh, of that normal chain of conversation. I think what it's basically told us is what we probably knew 10 years ago is that we need to be much more vigilant and we need to be very clear that if we know something is going to happen, how are, are we very clear where our sensitive and valuable data is? If we can allocate resources, you know, to Mel's point, we're never going to get the staff we need to meet the moment. You know, just from a regulatory perspective, where I kind of live, in by the end of 2016, 134 million people in our country will be subject to some data privacy reg uh, regulation, which means we will have to react, we will have to notify, we will have to do whatever to service that population. The amount of work will far exceed our ability um, with hands on the keyboard. So we have to think differently. We have to be prepared. You know, to your point, Mel, about Skynet, you know, quantum computing is coming. AI is the beginning of that. And what, what I think AI has done, which is, you know, somewhat concerning for the security community is it's make, it's made moderate nefarious actors now near nation state. Now they can do things and they can access and they can uh, attack at a much higher velocity and what much more robust. And now are groups that you didn't necessarily think before now are at the highest levels. So I think it's raised our game. It's, we need to be very clear and we need to have alternative approaches. But lastly, and most importantly, knowing where our data is, knowing where the risk is. And if they're going to attack your house, let them attack the shed, not, you know, where the kids sleep, if that makes sense. Yep, that makes absolute sense, Richard. And very nicely is a segue onto my next question. Um, and before I do, um, to our audience, I know we, we've had a couple of questions that are on route, but just a quick reminder, we'll be coming to our audience Q&A with our panel in around about 10 minutes or so. So do feel free. Uh, Elizabeth, I know we, we've got your question. We've got a couple of others as well. Uh, feel free to sling questions in our direction and we'll make sure that we can bring you up with our panel in around about 10 minutes. As a side note, actually, before just as, before we move on, I did actually find a, a good another good example from The Guardian over here in the UK, reported a US-Israeli cybersecurity firm. This is direct quote, had used the latest iteration chat GPT to produce a credible seeming phishing email. It circumvented the chatbot safety procedures by telling the tool that it needed a template of a phishing email for an employee awareness program. So, you know, layers upon layers upon layers, where does it end? I mean, it's a, it's a never ending tale, one that's increasingly moving to Skynet, as, as you, you say there, Mel. Um, but Richard, to your point there, you know, coming from a, a regulatory perspective, and Adam, I'm going to come back up to yourself for this. You know, we've, we've spoken already from, from, from the opener all the way through um, a, a lot around the threats, attack types, security vulnerabilities, uh, and Elise alluded to those there. I'd like to frame this question in another trinity, compliance, 
regulation, liability insurance. You know, while it is indeed that wild west for the world cyber criminals, IT leaders, their organisations fully, you know, it's not fully, further harnessed by such stringent compliance standards across the board with good reason. Uh, but how do you best find that balance between pushing the boundaries of your own cybersecurity and not falling foul of those, those regulatory and, and cyber liability uh, and insurance compliance components? There's that balance there. You know, while you've got that Wild West on the one hand that can move quickly, that can test, can fail, can learn, can iterate, can stay extremely agile, we've got those you know those slower turning bigger beer moth that, that that take a long time to catch up a very big question i appreciate but adam what's your take on that i'm sorry could you could you rephrase i think there there was a lot to a lot to unpack there i apologize <laughs> there was indeed my 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 apologies completely so it's how do we balance out the idea of needing to push the boundaries as much as possible in the right way with your own cybersecurity strategy as an organization without falling foul of what can seemingly be stringent regulatory and compliance requirements that you have to adhere to. You know, I think a, a, a starting point for a lot of organizations, and I'd be curious to get the panel's thought on this, is, is to start with a risk assessment for AI. And, and one of the one of our attendees actually posted that the MITRE and NIST are working on AI frameworks and NISTs actually came out. Um, their 1.1, it looks like dropped earlier um, this year, but it's in planning since 2022. So, you know, that's great to see and, and something that I had missed. But I think that, you know, the that risk assessment, and as Richard was talking about, understanding where the data is, what are the implications there? Um, you know, it's no secret that the chatbots have started to infiltrate the workplace. Companies are, are kind of grappling with those implement, uh, you know, those implications. But you know, what are the metrics around tracking for AI? You know, what are the risks for our organization? How are they going to manifest themselves? What controls do we need to put in place or guardrails, policies, and procedures? Is that clear? Is that communicated? Is that documented? Then, and of course, training the employees in the organization on how to do so safely. You know, a panel that I was on um, about a month ago, there we we got into a similar topic, and there was you know there was one gentleman that said you know we've embraced it, we've started to inject some of our information, marketing materials, prompts, messaging into the AI tool so that we can accelerate certain things. But on the other side of the coin, I think there was a gentleman from a healthcare provider that said we're not bringing AI into our organization at all. The risk is simply too high. So I think that, you know, starting with that assessment, understanding the implications, and then how do we put those guardrails in place is going to be, you know, really critical. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Adam. And uh, Rick, down to yourself for, for the same question, feel free to, to expand and open up on, on anything you've heard from Adam. No, I, I agree with Adam. First thing we've done is, is obviously a risk assessment as well. However, it's important to note, you know, again, as you heard me talk earlier, I work primarily on the red team side. Uh, I've got an operation side that deals with the blue team. But what we've discovered on the red team side is the rules equal the both sides. But we've got all these, you know, uh, similar to probably many of you out there, um, my entities are, are subject to HIPAA, you know, PCI, uh, SOX, ISO 27001. We've got many different frameworks we've got to follow. Unfortunately, again, some of the uh, more nefarious were uh, bots that I'm working with and, and the AI um, community, um, they don't have to play by those same rules. So it's it's really interesting having to balance what our workers can do, what my employees can do, what as a corporation, what we've what we've you know accounted for under our risk assessment, and then all the things we haven't accounted for that are coming at us just like the Wild West. Those were GPTs, and you know everyone can go to you know there's an AI for that .com and you know find all these various different AIs that are out there. What do you do? I mean, you can block these at some level uh, on your on your corporate devices. You can block these and, and regulate them within guidelines and and uh, from your policy perspectives. Um, however, curiosity is getting the best of people outside of the workplace and even inside the workplace. Um, you know, on their phones, on on, on other areas. So, um, yeah, you know, I I kind of I like Adam's point about the the one healthcare individual who said we're not introducing it into into our company. You already have it's already there, whether you wanted it or not, it's already there. So we have to remember that 
whilst we're trying to work within the regulatory uh, confinements that we have to and those guidelines, we still have to account for and find those areas that are working outside of those because it is the Wild West out there. And that probably concerns me more than anything. It's not what my employees are doing that is probably correct and, and, and totally legitimate. It's what's happening behind the scenes that uh, we don't know about where these hundreds or thousands of, of AIs that are out there right now that are maybe don't meet those criteria, but they have access to or found access to. Um, it's gonna infiltrate one way or the other. It's whether you've accounted for it or not. Yeah, absolutely. And that's not even considering shadow IT and the, the, the known unknowns. And that's an entirely other conversation in itself. Um, Richard, I'm going to come down to you and then Mel, I'm going to shoot straight up to you afterwards. Um, but Rich, keen to come down to you, obviously, you know, from, from a regulatory perspective and indeed your own perspective, um, feel free as always to open up on, on what you've heard from Rick and Adam. Um, what is that fulcrum balancing point? You know, how does that work in your mind's eye? So well, what I would say is AI is here to stay. Right. We are going to use it. Our, you know, senior leadership, they hear things, see things, they get excited. You need to be able to innovate. One of the things I always try to think about is a risk based approach and practical security and practical regulatory components. Right. My mantra is always, are we in a defendable position? Can we say definitively we're putting the appropriate safeguards? We're doing our due diligence. And I think really what I'm trying to drive home to my, you know, user base and our development teams and IT in general and finance and legal and everywhere is, do we have business purpose? And to really understand using AI creates data, creates risk. Data is a toxic asset. The more you have, the more toxicity you have. Now there's value there and there's a way to mine that and use it in a way that helps your business and your clients and whatever. But are do you have legitimate business purpose do you have a defendable position and are we staying true to our principles on data safeguards and data security? If we do that, then, and that message makes its way all the way down the stack. And lastly, we are partners in this. I am not a, I am not a, a blocker. I'm not a fence. I'm here to help provide guidance and thought leadership. But since AI is here to stay, you can't just take your ball and go home. You might as well work along the rails with the teams and how do you innovate in a way that creates a, the risk level that your organization is willing to tolerate. Love that, Richard. And actually a really important part to highlight. And again, I saw a lot of nodding heads there. You know, we are partners in this. You know, even in this panel, you know, it's been easy and I've fallen foul probably of, of creating uh, my own approach on, you know, it's it's uh, how do we help and how do we train our colleagues over here, well, actually, we're all one and the same in that boat. And it's about finding those shared collaboration points and making sure that we stay on that same proverbial team. Thank you very much. Mel, up to yourself, sir, for the for the same question. Um, there's a lot of cat themes in the comments. Uh, you know, cat's already out of the bag. Curiosity killed the cat, which is my own I'm adding in there. Um, but over to you for, for the same question. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> uh... I, again, just I, I'm going to say ditto, right? Uh, Richard, those are great. That's great advice, and and, and Rick, um, Adam, you know, being being that you're 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 gender, generationally uh, 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 surpassed by at least two of us, uh, you know, last thirty years we've had everything from infosec to legal to compliance and IT security and all these groups have been the anchor. Right. They've been all, you know, I'm old and I remember being a, a sysadmin and a developer and I wanted just to charge ahead. I was bringing every beta, every tool, every library. I didn't care. I wasn't scanning anything. Um, and then reality creeped in. Oh, let's release. Well, have you run it through, you know, X, Y, Z. And then all of a sudden, three months later, you might be able to release. Obviously, in the last decade or two, uh, from an IT or security standpoint, it's become you have to be an enabler, you have to be a business partner. You've got to, you know, you've got to work through that. Um, I always go on the the avenue of minimum viable effort, right? What can you do in small chunks, not MVP, but an effort, right? What can you do in small chunks with the existing resources to do that validation, right? We talked about quantifying whether or not it's a business value, right, and kind of pulling that in. But now 
everyone, and I just saw an article this morning, just before hopping on here, which by the way, I'm on the West Coast in, in the States, so quite early. Uh, but um, I just saw an article about the CIO role and how it's changing to absorb more of the security pieces, right? CIO role has typically been the enabler, the, the optimizer, the you know, and now all of the security pieces are coming in. So if you're not a, 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 a you know, and the, the CISO role has typically been this, this nebulous of, of you know, hooded, no offense, hooded hackers that are trying to do red team, blue team, purple team exercises. And, you know, they're the ones who, who come into the org and do, you know, these pieces. Those are merging, right? So you, so the CISO role in the last five to 10 years has become the enabler. This is the perfect topic. And AI and modeling has been around business organizations for a long time. But this is a absolutely completely different pivot, right? When you're talking about LLMs and anything else, this is a true business enabler. And that's why I said we're not bringing in AI in-house is laughable. Companies who don't bring in AI are literally going, mark them down, give them five to 10 years, they will be at the bottom of their industry, right? Because you, this is the biggest advancement. So you have to be able to become an enabler. How do you do that? Richard covered an excellent uh, set of those, understanding the risks, understanding what you can do, and, and, and Rick as well, and then being able to introduce it, right? You have to have the innovation teams working with the, the security teams, working with the CIO teams to really kind of pull together those due diligence pieces. Now, Give me a Raspberry Pi. Give me, give me a few libraries. I, I can set up a, an isolated air gap lab, load some data in there and showcase to the senior leadership. By the way, this is what you can do, right? You know, all you need is one person, one hackathon, one weekend, and your teams could create some incredible uh, value to the business. So if you are not an enabler, if you're not introducing this, if you are saying you're not bringing it in-house, you're absolutely destined to number one, be attacked. Number two, not raise the awareness and the importance of how you could 10x your uh, your your uh, your performance, your income, or otherwise. I'm done. Sorry, I get on these diatribes. No worries at all, Mel. I mean, that amount of energy at eight o'clock in the morning is is where you want to be. <laughs> thank you i love the minimal viable effort piece as well i think absolutely right um i'm conscious that we're kind of moving into our last 15 minutes or so and we do have an audience question from elizabeth so I'm going to give us a couple of seconds when we'll bring elizabeth up if we can just get her online we should be seeing her in just a second elizabeth yes how, how hi you? can you hear me okay i can indeed how are you Good, good. Fantastic. Um, I will pass you over to the panel. Ask away. Okay. <laughs> um, just a little bit of background. One of the things that we, I, I work for Ally Bank, and one of the things that we really strive to do is um, we have a very strict phishing program where there are different phishing um uh, phishing examples that are generated and then um, and basically, you know, uh, what we do is it's like, OK, if somebody actually responds to this fake fish that we've put out, then we basically kind of tag them and say, you know, look, you fell for this. These are some things that you could have done. Um, and what so i guess uh what i'm and and actually it's very strict i mean if you if you hit one of those three times then you have to go through a training uh situation and all of that so it, it's taken very very seriously um just so that we can kind of improve that process i mean some of the things that everybody looks for in the, you know, when we're looking to see if something is a fish is tap, tapping on the, you know, the actual, so we can see the actual email, the actual, um, you know, where that is really coming from. Uh, and you can usually tell pretty quickly, okay, this really isn't coming from Ally, it's coming from somewhere else. And so my question is, how advanced is this AI uh, process where, I, I mean, is the AI actually able to 
fake those email addresses? Or if we're on our toes, can we still click on that and find that this really is a fish? Good question. Anybody want to take that first? No? In which case... Well, let, let, me, over to let, let me over jump to in. So, so you know, the, the logistics and the, the workflows around emails, um, it, you know, if you have a poorly monitored and a poorly set up email routing, right? AI is going to be able to bypass it one way or another, right? So everything from DMARC, DKIM, all the, you know, especially all these other pieces are absolutely critical. Now, can there be an injection into one of those paths, right? So AI actually, and a hacker actually hops into one of those paths, maybe adds another set of, of, uh, of, of IPs or credentials or trust it, sure. So the trust level around the headers and the information that's in the email is really bound to the core system. So if you've got the, the uh, uh, most up to date and you've got layers in there where you're not only the key system, but other layers to check, then the validity of the route should be validated, but they're getting so sophisticated, not in the route, but in the content, right? And that's where the, the criticality is, right? Uh, Rick mentioned creating a fake dialogue, right? And going through that, um, there's still the, the the impact of being able to, to spoof to some level to get into the inbox, but it's the actual content that looks so real, right? They've resolved all these, the misspellings and the and the hokey pieces. And then you get really sophisticated things where they're using extended characters to replace characters. So the domains look the same, right? So you've got the, you know, you let's say for example, uh, uh, you know, uh, American Airlines, AA, right? The A's, could be extended characters that were registered. At, so it looks just like a normal domain. So little things like that, that are really hard, hard to see if you're in a rush, if it's the middle of the night or otherwise, where you glance over, you hover over the, the lake, you're like, oh, that looks, this looks legit and you're done. So the systems and the layers and the discovery need to be continuously adapted on the back end. But it's it's they're going to continue to advance. So the more we advance on one end, um, and and I bring this up, and Rich, I think you mentioned it. Um, there is, you know, when you're looking at the history of hacking and everything else, AI injecting into those points. If we went back 30 years, we'd be screwed now forever, right? But right now, you you know, if you look at the 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 90s and 2000s, there were script kiddies. Right, the early two thousands, everybody was creating a you know piece. You know, you had you know, oh, send me an executable in an email, right? And I would run it, yeah. you know, yeah. And and then you you advanced ten years later, and you started to get the the the, the hackers and you know the groups that started to develop. The, I, the last ten plus years has been enterprise level efforts, right? Co like they, they're actually making money off of this. This is a money making enterprise level piece. You comp compound this with the advancements, like Richard said, in quantum, and you you already have a, a nation state quantum level attacks. You put all the data that you have and all of the data that you can scour. The advancements are going to be Skynet level automatically injecting and finding every possible CVE, every possible breakpoint, every possible injection point. So the best thing to do is to continuously train and on the back end for our IT and infrastructure folks and our security folks is to make sure that we're adapting the tools at multiple layers. It's the most, it's the campiest cliche of shit to say when you talk about defense in depth, guess what? You better go deeper. And right. I think to, to that point, I think Mel, all those points spot on. I think another thing that we have to think about, and this is a little off topic, is when you're in the throes of this situation, your senior leadership, everyone needs to know their role. They need to know their function. And we need to be assertive, right? We need to move quickly. 10 years ago, there could be a little bit more, um, you know, being more deliberate slightly. Now, minutes matter. Right. So if we're in those throes of those incidents, we have to make quick decisions and everyone needs to be on board. And another thing I would say is when you have your your IR team on retainer, which if you don't absolutely get because you're going to need that quick. What I would suggest is if you have a tool that you use pervasively through your organization, have your incident response retainer be that company. 
to come in and apply tools after the fact, it's too late. You want the tools that are in-house that the teams can collect and eradicate and move forward. Uh, time is the biggest enemy in these situations because you don't oh. want to be subject to these things. Right. So, okay. So with, um, so like everybody, as far as email tool goes, I mean, everybody in our company uses Outlook. So um, would we need to talk to our uh, development teams on who is, at, you know, on how, like the questions that, you know, we need to ask is how many layers are are currently going on now? Um, and as far as a user actually being able to identify this as a, you know, as a, a, a fish, um, I, I mean, are we screwed? Or if we, so if we click on it, then, you know, if we, because that's kind of habit for me is I'll just click on the, on the thing and say, okay, well, this is really from this person. So is AI able to just completely, you know, get in and spoof that whole email address? So what I think, Elizabeth, you want to think about it is that, you know, the, the malicious actors using AI, but also the, the, the good guys, the proof points, the, you know, the Microsoft's, everyone's kind of in the same space, but I don't think we ever divert from the basic pillars. Who are your filters? What does your training look like? Are we aware and is our is our user base kind of understanding what this looks like? Reinforced awareness, not training once a year. It's constant drip of oh, making sure people yeah. are, are, are lined up against this and oh, knowing yeah. that every day we have to stay vigilant. What we did yesterday didn't matter. It's about today in the moment. That's when it matters. If I've been great for the last 10 years and never clicked on a fish and I do it today, no one's going to remember that. Right. Uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so that's why I'm just trying to make sure that we're as armed as we can be. Keep in... arming up. That's what I'd say. <laughs> keep Elizabeth, what? Keep, keep, keep arming up. up. <laughs> to, to your point, Elizabeth, no, the, the, the emails, you know, AI hasn't made fake emails that are come across valid. That's not really the case. But what it has done, God. it's been more intelligent about how it presents it. Right. Um, when we use AI to create phishing emails and you just expose something to me, use Outlook. I've got a specific template I use when creating AI generated emails for phishing for Outlook users. I know how the fonts present in Microsoft. I know what special characters to use to make that email address look way more valid. Two L's, I use to capitalize. They come across the same because Microsoft presents in a lowercase, doesn't care. Um, so we see, you'll see those things. So, oh shit, this looks legit. But more importantly, we pretext it so well. We might even use AI to message you over LinkedIn first. Might do many other things saying, hey, I'm going to send you my CV. You know, and then you get that email. You are expecting it. The pretexts are there for you to lower your guard on looking at that email. Oh yeah, I was looking for it from Rick from bill.com instead of B-I-I-I.com with two capital L's at the end or two capital I's at the end presenting as L's. So we, we, we set all of that up and we pretext it to lower your guard in those areas where you otherwise would normally look. And then with that pretexting in there, you're expecting these things, you see it, it all looks legit and we've got you. So those are the things that we need to make sure that we're assimilating with our little tests and, and things that we're doing to keep everybody up to speed on this. Yeah, the rules haven't changed. The focus has. Right. Yep. That's you. that's wonderful advice, guys. I I really really appreciate that because those are all th those are all things that I'm going to take back to um to our to our teams and uh, so that we can move forward with this because this is super super scary. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Elizabeth, thank you very much for coming up and asking the question as well. Really appreciate it. A lot a lot of value in that. Uh, and we're going to wave goodbye to, to you now. And we're going to move back to one last question. Before we do, I have to hold my hands up here. As a presenter and writer by trade, Adam's comment there, you even mentioned that the R in the N is used, was used in that example with Microsoft. And yet my brain and still scans that word as Microsoft. I didn't see the R in the N. So, you know, more fool me, one. Um, maybe that's something that I shouldn't have shared. 
Uh, but it just goes to show how prevalent and how <laughs> obvious that can be. Um, nonetheless, I'm going to do. I'm uh, going to wrap us up for for today's panel and indeed our showcase with a uh, one final quick fire question. Adam, I'm going to come up to you first. You know, we've spoken a lot about the the rightly so the negatives, the risks, the threats, um, every the attacks. Um, but what excites you most about the future? You know, when we look about the opportunities, what's coming off the horizon? That, that really interests you as an opportunity that gets you excited? You know, I, I think I'm, I'm interested to see where it goes and where to one of Richard's earlier points, you know, the folks like Microsoft and Proofpoint and others, you know, where can we continue to expand the, the use case for, for good? We've started to, at, uh, at Kaseya, use the, the chatbots for some rough outlining and planning. We don't inject uh, any of our data, but we are using the GPT uh, 3.5 to kind of help guide us. And it's it's really fascinating. And sometimes it can help you break through that piece of, you know, that little bit of writer's block. And I think that you know, one of the challenges that we've had early on is that, you know, for the white hats, high quality data to train these models is, is limited. There's a lot of sensitive and siloing um, around the nature of security data. So I think that as we continue to expand on that data set, as it becomes more comprehensive, we'll understand some of those use cases. The models will continue to become more accurate. So I'm interested to see, you know, kind of what the future looks like. But to one of the earlier points, you know, ensuring that there's regulation, there's the appropriate amount of risk and guardrails is in place will be, you know, equally as important. But I think that there's a, a tremendous amount of opportunity on the uh, on the horizon for us. Absolutely. Uh, we just had a quick one from Richard out to drop, but said, thank great, fantastic session. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm going to get 30 seconds, Mel, from yourself. 30 seconds from Rick as well and really squeeze the last minute out. Same question to you. What, what's exciting you most, Mel? Um, uh, 30 seconds, impossible, but I'll try to keep it 30 <laughs> seconds. Um, the, the excitement for me is um, everything from images to video to content to the ability to be able to make my job easier with AI uh, internally and externally. Uh, I'm already using it uh, for, from image creation, Dolly and everything else. Um, and the excitement that you actually have a, a an avenue to help the business, to help the business actually see security, right? Actually see IT advancements, actually see business and marketing and sales to be able to, to do that. Um, it's almost that same feeling that you may have gotten like eight to 10 years ago with RPA. Holy crap, you had this process that you should take a week. All of a sudden it takes two hours and it runs by itself. It's that level of excitement, but beyond, because you're, you're going to be even more creative to create more solutions and drive better decisions. Love that answer. Thank you, Matt. And finally, Rick, down to yourself, sir. I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm benefiting from the inclusion of all of this. I mean, security has kind of gotten into a table stakes kind of mode for a long period of time. And AI came out, all of a sudden, all the executives, all the investors, everybody's scared. Everybody's talking to us again. And, and we're now at the forefront of, of enabling, I love that word, enabling this technology and seeing the speed to which it operates, as well as benefiting it from the security side. I'm, we're doing pen tests in one-tenth the time from the reporting perspective, I mean, yeah, the pen test still takes the period of time, but the reporting time that we used to do, documenting everything, putting into format, we drop that into AI now, and it comes, spits out a report that I would spend four or five hours on. It's done in 15, 20 minutes. Love that aspect of it. But I really love the challenge, the opportunity it presents businesses, um, the speed to which we can operate. But more importantly, like I said, it's brought security back to the forefront again, uh, which we, you know, we were there, but not really there. It was kind of like, yeah, we you could take it for granted. Uh, and, and people are scared now. And I love that. I love being in that forefront of engaging this technology and enabling it. Fantastic stuff. Well, Rick, Mel, Adam, and indeed Richard, our panel for today, thank you very much for joining us. Indeed, to Elizabeth and Mohammed as well for the questions and to our wider audience for taking time out of what I know are very busy schedules. That is us at time uh, from our team here at Synergy. We'll be in touch with you in the coming days to get feedback, provide any further information that you would like. Of course, today's recording and the slides 
for anyone and everyone that would like them and to connect you up and continue those all important conversations. But for now, from me and the team here in the studio, have a great rest of your day. Take care and goodbye.